you hear a little bird in the background, there's a lot happening in this house and I'm sorry. Bibliophiles of the internet, my name's Adriana and today I'm so excited because this marks the beginning of my reading vlog for The City We Became by N.K. Jemisin. Shout out to Rhea from the Bookfinch for suggesting this reading vlog. It just goes to show if you think there's a book I should read and I actually agree with you, I might make that content. Now I am proud to say I have read everything by N.K. Jemisin, all of her major works, pretty much all of her short fiction, and I'm definitely looking forward to keeping that streak alive. This is her latest release. It just came out on March 24th. From what I understand, it's an urban fantasy story that imagines cities as having souls. And this story is all about New York City, which doesn't just have one soul, it has six. And those souls are manifested as people, as avatars who I'm guessing possess some kind of power or magic. But every city also has a dark side and some ancient evil is awakening in New York City that threatens to destroy everything unless these six avatars can come together and stop it once and for all. I feel like I've waited my whole life for this. I'm so excited to dive in. I don't really have any set expectations, but I know it's gonna be so good. I know it's gonna go there. I know N.K. Jemisin's writing is the balm we need right now, especially because she does not go gentle on the world and all its problems. I'm very much looking forward to starting this and sharing my first impressions. I also want to say I am going to take my time with this. I like to spend a little bit longer with N.K. Jemisin's books, so I may not do daily updates, but updates every few days. And as far as in-between footage, obviously we're just stuck here at home trying to stay safe, trying to stay healthy, and nothing dreadfully exciting is happening, so I don't know what you're going to get, but we're going to do our best. Okay, so I got off to a great start with this book. I didn't get to read anything yesterday because I was so focused on filming my March wrap up, but I am counting down the seconds until I can get back to it. The city we became is such a fast paced, dynamic start. The prologue is basically a callback to The City Born Great from How Long Till Black Future Month. So regardless of whether you're familiar with the short story or not, every reader is starting from the same place. There's a ton of action very early on in the story, which is kind of different for N.K. Jemisin. She always draws her reader in right away, but the magic in her stories usually unfurls and reveals itself more slowly with a lot more precursory character development beforehand, but this book wastes no time in knocking you on your ass. So far I've been introduced to one of these avatars and the power, the magic they have is so cool and exciting, and I think what makes it so cool is that it's very imprecise. This magic embodies a kind of attitude, a feeling, a mindset. It relies heavily on emotion and instinct as opposed to some more tactile black and white magic systems. It reminds me of why I was so drawn to Orogeny in the Broken Earth trilogy, because you know what it is, you know how it works, but its magnitude is very closely tied to the user's emotions and experiences. The power in this story comes from the feeling of the city itself. It comes from belonging in a place, being of a place, not merely occupying that place. It's a really fascinating system, and I think the conflict these avatars are going to face is the struggle of embodying and, in a way, representing an entire population of the city while still only being one person. So it's going to come down to how their experience as individuals contrasts with the experience of the collective and trying to grasp the communal power that comes from that dissonance. And there's also the question of how they retain their individuality and identity while going through these extraordinary, all-consuming circumstances. 
senses. It's also really fun to be reading from the viewpoint of someone who doesn't know what's happening, doesn't know how any of this works, doesn't know anything about this evil they're up against, and who's discovering their abilities along the way. There's also this really cool idea that even though the average New Yorker doesn't know about these powers and this ancient evil, they still subconsciously react to it, which is what causes street closures and traffic jams that seem to have no beginning, and that's why strange things happen every day in the city and everyone's just like, yeah, that's New York. I'm really interested to see how N.K. Jemisin is going to play with that idea as the story continues. I also forgot to mention that my library came through with the audiobook, which is awesome. There's incredible sound effects and this intense rhythmic music that kicks in when the action picks up, and it's just such good production quality that is so satisfying to listen to. It just makes me so happy because I've listened to a number of N.K. Jemisin's books on audio, and while they've been good, this is the level of production quality her storytelling deserves, and and we love to see it. So those are my first impressions of the city we became, surprising absolutely no one. I freaking love it, and I look forward to continuing on and sharing more in my next update. I am now roughly a third of the way through. Every time I think about going back to this story, I get a little bit nervous because I always wonder, am I ready for what N.K. Jemisin is about to give me? And the answer is always no, but it's always so easy to fall right back into her stories. Something I touched on the other day was how the avatars don't have explicit directions or instructions. They don't really know what to do, but there's something subconscious, some kind of ancient instinct that encourages them to do what feels right. And it feels like a way of saying that the most effective way to fight evil is to be ourselves. You have to understand that in this story there are no magical artifacts, there's no talisman, there's no symbols of power, there's no magic wands. The way these avatars fight back could be through music or technology or by tapping into the energy of landmarks. These ordinary things that are imbued with power on an individual basis. Like what has power for one person might not have power for someone else. It comes through whether that thing has been assigned meaning by someone or not. And the story continues to complicate the city's relationship with power itself. There's power that comes from the city's beauty, its energy, its movement, its singularity, but there's an equal and opposing power that comes from its darkness and its ugliness. For example, this ancient evil referenced in the synopsis seems to come in many forms. At the moment, it's surfacing as this almost parasitic force being spread by a woman in white. And it's interesting to see what kind of people are susceptible to spreading this evil force. It seems to be the racists, the bigots, the gentrifiers, the colonizers, the entitled, those lacking in empathy for other folks. I think the easy read would be to say that Jemison is trying to telegraph evil as being white, but I don't think that's the case. I think the significance of the color white is in reference to people who are a blank slate, who only nurture a single viewpoint, and who are susceptible to influence so long as it doesn't challenge their point of view. I mean, white isn't even technically a color, but rather an absence, and I think that's why this main villain, so to speak, is pictured in white. I also love that this cast of characters are of all different backgrounds and ages. I think we so often assume that saving the world is the business of young, attractive, conventionally active people, but this story, along with so many of N.K. Jemisin's other stories, shows us that is not necessarily the case. So far, Manhattan and Brooklyn are both black. Manhattan is in grad school, and Brooklyn is a middle-aged hip-hop artist turned politician. Manhattan's roommate is a British Asian trans man, and the Bronx looks to be a nearly 70-year-old, possibly Native American, self-described dyke. If you're wondering whether I am living my best life, the short answer is yes. So I'm definitely still loving the story in a very big way. The endgame remains mysterious and elusive at this point, which is really exciting to me, and I'm just loving how much I get immersed in the storytelling every single time I pick it back up. So I will keep reading and report back later with more thoughts.
So I'm currently about 60% through and I can feel my excitement and my enthusiasm towards the story growing with each day that passes. I did want to circle back real quick to the Bronx because she was confirmed as being part of the Lenape Nation as well as Two Spirit and Queens is actually an undocumented immigrant from India so it's really cool to have both of their perspectives in the mix. At this point in the story, you're starting to wonder why all these people specifically were chosen to essentially represent all these different boroughs. As I mentioned before, they come from all different backgrounds and age groups. Some of them are homeless or queer or people of color or immigrants. And that made me realize that these avatars are the people who have always had to fight for their lives. There was a really interesting discussion about agency and choice, how they could just walk away and someone else would basically take their place in this fight. But why would they walk away from what's ultimately yet another fight to determine their own right to exist? They have all fought this very same fight before and they will fight it again many, many more times in their lives. There's also a lot of really interesting ideas about duality, like how these avatars are both their own person and also an entire city all at once. It seems like they're able to draw on that force of the collective and that power is pinpointed or concentrated through that one avatar's experiences. And those powers continue to impress because, like I said, they don't shoot laser beams out of their eyes or move things telekinetically, but rather their power seems to come from ideas and concepts and constructs. It's hard to explain, but all of that power stems from the mythos of the city itself. All of the stories New Yorkers tell about their quintessentially New York experiences, all these ideas we cling to about people from certain parts of New York, even the mythology of the Avatar's own lives, all of that generates a literal kind of energy and power that these Avatars can use. The mythology of the self is proving to be a very powerful tool, and it's all the stories these Avatars have told themselves about their own lives, things they believe in, things they associate with themselves, memories they hold close in their hearts. All of that acts as a power source. This is what I was getting at on day one when I said this power is imprecise, so to speak, but it's deeply emotional and personal, and that's what makes it all the more fascinating to witness. Speaking of power, I think it's really interesting that so far this ancient evil is not showing itself as a monster or a big bad, at least not consistently, but rather it's shown as an invasion or a corruption of the city itself. That corruption is being focused through these modern forms of evil, I guess you could say, like gentrifiers, alt-right neo-Nazis, doxers, people whose minds are already corrupt. And that just reminds me of why N.K. Jemisin's world building is so effective, especially in this modern day real world setting. She's giving you both a fantastical explanation for why New York is the way it is, while also giving a nod to the layeredness, the complexity, and also the beauty of the city as it actually is. These kinds of people who willingly attack other people actually do exist, but now there's also like a supernatural reason for why they're focusing their attacks in a very concentrated way. And I'm definitely seeing the the emergence of this conflict between ancient life forms and mortals, which is something you see across many of N.K. Jemisin's works. She does it so well, giving the audience this inkling of how vast and terrifying this unknown power is, but then also contrasting that with these distinctly personable characters who inject a sense of immediacy by focusing the story on concrete tasks. I get that this ancient evil and this conflict is so much bigger than I can even understand, even at this point in the story, but I'm also grounded by these avatars getting the gang together, feeling out their powers, and preparing themselves for this fight. Listen, I just know N.K. Jemisin is gonna freak my freaking bean in the final part of the story, and I am both ready for it and also very much not. So pray for me, wish me luck, because going forward, I am definitely gonna need it.
So I finished it yesterday morning on my walk and I am still trying to process all these thoughts and emotions. I'm gonna put that down because that's a lot. As predicted, N.K. Jemisin continues to amaze and surprise. I was actually in the middle of a silent reading live stream the other day when she dropped the first multi-dimensional bomb on me and it took everything in me not to visibly react. There was a lot of shallow breathing and I had to cover my face from the camera because it was so much, but in the best possible way. And again, it's just a testament to N.K. Jemisin's world building because she's able to weave these intricate, expansive concepts and present them in a way that makes complete sense, even though on the very edges there's still some level of ambiguity proving that you don't have the entire picture yet. And because of the way she gradually builds and fills out the mythology of the story, you're almost devastated by these reveals because part of you feels like you should have seen it in hindsight. I guess what I'm trying to say is that she makes the impossible seem obvious. I can pinpoint a moment like that in pretty much every single one of her books, and honestly, no one does it as well as N.K. Jemisin does. I haven't really talked about it much so far, but I really enjoy the dynamic between characters, especially between the avatars, because there's a sort of begrudging trust between all of them, and there's definitely a strong sense of camaraderie there, because they all understand and recognize each other in a way that no one else does. But even though they're all part of one city, they're very much disparate personalities. They're not always united which to me is a realistic reflection of how cities actually function. If you were to break down a city into different geographic parts, you would see that the people in those different parts don't vote the same way, don't live the same way, they might have different population majorities or certain sensibilities that are specific to that region. No city is one thing or made up of one kind of population, which is what makes them so beautiful but also so complex. So these human representations of the boroughs definitely have this motley crew of rebels feel to them. They bicker, they sass each other, they don't always agree on every course of action, but they're also able to see the power each of them possesses, which is what creates a sense of connection and respect. They're all different, their powers are vastly unique and personal, and they all definitely have that disaster energy of going through this on the fly and desperately trying to do their best. I feel like I've talked about it almost every day, but their powers are very much born from love and born from a deep understanding of the borough they represent. But especially in this final act, there's definitely this idea that power also comes from ownership, in a sense. And there's different kinds of ownership. There's monetary ownership, there's land ownership, there's intellectual ownership, and there's a metaphorical kind of ownership that comes from owning your truth and believing your right to exist in any given place. There's a sense of power and belonging that comes from no knowing yourself and embracing yourself, and to see that kind of power take on a very literal form in this story is such a gratifying experience. So it's cool because there's definitely monsters and battles and all these hallmarks of the classic sci-fi genre of invasion stories, but the powers both sides are using are not always so concrete. I've said it before, but this story shows emotion as power, sense of self as power, social constructs as power that have just as much of a literal effect and impact as they do in our everyday lives. I'm not going to talk about spoilers, but in terms of the ending, I think it was played perfectly. There's a big satisfying confrontation, but the door is still definitely open and N.K. Jemisin leaves just the right amount of unanswered questions to give you the sense that something even bigger and more sinister is definitely coming down the pipe. Obviously, I highly recommend this one. It strikes the perfect balance of action, emotion, humor, and wry social awareness, and it's definitely setting itself up to be a contender for one of the all-time best N.K. Jemisin series. So that is a wrap on the city we became. If you stayed until the very end, leave me a city emoji down below in the comments, and if you've read this one yourself or if you plan to read it in the future, I would love to know your thoughts. Also, if you have any suggestions for books to include in future reading vlogs, I would love to hear those down below as well. But that's everything I had for this reading vlog today. Thank you so much for watching this video. I really hope that you enjoyed it, and I'll catch you on the flip side of the page.